Namaskar. I am Suresh Ratan. I am talking with you from Department of uh, Molecular Biology and Genetics uh, at uh, Aarhus University, Aarhus, Denmark. About two years ago, when uh, one of the main organizers of this uh, uh, Indian Academy of Neurosciences uh, conference, Professor Anita Jigotha, invited me to give a keynote lecture at this conference. I was very much looking forward to meeting you all in Hyderabad. Uh, at that time, we never knew what will be happening in 2020. So now, courtesy Corona, we are all sitting in there in our own lockdown places and trying to communicate with each other. I'm very happy uh, to be able to participate in your 38th annual conference of the Indian Academy of Neurosciences. And I will be talking for about half an hour, uh, giving you an overview of the field of aging. Because within aging field, uh, this role of the brain, the neurosciences is very, very crucial. So I will just give a general understanding of what we know in the field of aging, what we want to do with that knowledge, how much we can actually do and how much is just our wishful thinking or fantasy. So when we talk about aging, there are basically two ways of talking. One is aging as if it happens throughout life. Yeah? Any change occurring with the time. Uh, some people would like to call that as aging. That's why in language we often use the word, uh, how old is your baby? Yeah? My granddaughter is now four years old. Is that what the word aging we are talking about here? Perhaps not. Yeah. In, the, in the linear scale that yes, aging can be considered any change happening with the time, but that does not make distinction uh, between the way we understand the word when we use the word aging and old age. And that is the second way of looking at that aging and old age as a different stage in life or different stages of life. And one of the stages is when aging we talk about. Because when we talk about the word or we use the word aging, it's not the child which comes into mind. What comes to mind is this kind of phenotype that aging is the period and the process during which our bodies become progressively weaker and weaker. And we become more and more frail. There are more chances of having one or more diseases and eventual death. So that is the common understanding of the word aging and old age. Now, when does that happen in our lifestyle? So that is why the previous painting where it was the stages up and down, I have divided into two. So the first part, the left part here, is not the aging part. The downhill part is the aging part. And when does it happen? During our lifetime, in evolutionary terms, especially in biology, what do we think? When does it happen? It happens if an organism lives longer than its essential lifespan. Now, this is a new term in the field introduced in the field of aging to compare with the, what we know maximum lifespan or average lifespan. But there is something called essential lifespan. Essential lifespan means the lifetime needed in evolutionary conditions for the evolution to fulfill the purpose of life of a biological system. So the purpose of life of a biological system from Darwinian theory of evolution is basically reproduction and continuation of generation. As a homo sapiens, I have the same purpose of life like C. elegans, Rattus rattus, Drosophila melanogaster. It can sound very depressing that is that the purpose of life of me? Yes, as a homo sapiens, as a member of the homo sapiens species, that is the purpose of life. As a human being, our purposes can range from beautiful art, literature, philosophy, religion, whatever we want to talk about. But today we are not going to talk about that. So essential lifespan is the lifespan needed by 
a species in its natural environments to grow, mature, and reproduce. Like Drosophila, in its natural environment, needs about seven days to do this job. But when I bring the uh, Drosophila in the laboratory, and those of you who also work on that kind of model system, it lives one month, two months, three months. A rat in nature, the essential lifespan of a rat is about one year. But in the laboratory, it can live three years. Same thing is about Homo sapiens. Our essential lifespan, the way nature requires it, nature means evolutionary processes, evolutionary selection. That is not more than 45 years. But now we know that in laboratory conditions, which means highly protected conditions of modern societies, we can expect to live double or somebody has lived almost triple than the essential lifespan. So aging, when we talk about aging, aging sets in if we live longer than the species lifespan. That is when aging sets in. Yeah? So ELS is the time, as I already mentioned, that aging sets in after essential lifespan, and the essential lifespan is this definition, the Darwinian definition of essential lifespan. Now, why evolution has allowed aging to happen? Why evolution has not made immortal systems? There are a wide range of theories, very complex and beautiful theories by evolutionary biologists given. And I don't have time to go through them, but there is generally this, that is the evolutionary neglect, because in nature, not many organisms actually survive beyond essential lifespan, or it's a genetic dustbin, or accumulation of mutations, or antagonistic pleiotropy, or disposable soma theory. These are fascinating, beautiful theories developed by the evolutionary biologists, which tell us that evolution has not selected for immortality. It allows aging to happen. And that is when we, we, now it will come whether it allows aging to happen or it causes aging. That will be uh, coming soon to that question. So during the last 50, 60 years, hundreds of biogerontologists like myself and all around the world, there have been good tradition of aging research in India also. That's where I was originally introduced to aging research. We have described what happens during aging at almost all level of organization. This is a great achievement, right from the population level to individual, to group, individual organs. That's where the brain people have done tremendous uh, contribution in understanding what happens to the brain and its all components and the cells and the molecules during aging. And then going down from the organs, systems, the cells, then it's a huge area of the metabolome where there is correlations made that during aging, this happens, this happens. I have just highlighted some of the main areas which are often talked about these days. What happens to stress responses? What happened to DNA methylation? What happened to telomeres, glycans, mTOR, IGF, every molecular pathways? It's a huge area. You are all aware of that. And that's not a small achievement. Showing that if we live longer than our species lifespan, if we live beyond essential lifespan, which is a great achievement of ourselves because evolution only wanted us for about 45 years, then during that period, one or more or all of these changes will happen. But most importantly, these changes will not happen equally to any two people or even within the same body. No two parts of the body become old at the same rate and to the same extent. Yeah, some people might have very sharp brain even until very old age or other way around. About 15% of the people over the age of 85 will get neurodegenerative diseases. But 85% of the people may not get any diseases, but they are still old. So aging happens so individualistically right from the individual level to organ level to tissue level to cell level and within the cell to molecular level there are no two molecules which become old at the same rate and to the same extent no two cells become old at the same rate and to the same extent 
Now, this is a fascinating observation, but the, which makes our field very challenging because if somebody is looking for magic solutions, magic pills, one pill for everything, all the time, for everybody, well, that is a fantasy or that is a fraud, whatever you want to call it. So we know that aging is very heterogeneous and individualistic. And one beautiful way of saying it was done uh, well, for the clinical data, for example, those of you who are aware of the clinical data, the scatter, if you have age and any measurement, the scatter increases with age. Older population has much wider uh, scatter in any measurement to do. Hmm? Whether some of the examples I have listed here where people have measured muscle mass, cognitive abilities, memory, stress tolerance, gait speed, the scatter increases with age. In younger ages, the populations or the individuals of a cohort are much more alike. They are not absolutely similar. There is a scatter, but this scatter increases. More we live, older we become, more different we become. And a Danish poet and philosopher said this statement in a, in a beautiful statement. We are born as copy, but we die as original. Born as copy means that we are within the evolutionary restraints. There are not too many different ways of being born. But longer we live, more different we become. So from human point of view, becoming old is a process of becoming authentic, original. Now that, those are the social aspects. I will try not to go into those aspects here, which I often get uh, very tempted towards. But we are born as copies, we die as original, basically telling in one sentence thousands of papers conclusions that aging is heterogeneous and individualistic. So what is then common? Are we so different? No, the common is our property, our ability to survive. We all use the word and we are familiar with the word homeostasis, maintaining the same state, which is actually a wrong term for biological systems. Biological systems are never static. We all know that. We all talk about that. But we use the wrong term homeostasis from machines, from uh, engineering. It is actually homeodynamics. A child is born with certain basic requirements for survival. But there is a big danger zone where things can go wrong in early childhood. During growth, development, maturation, by the time we reach our uh, reproductive maturity, this is what we have, a homeodynamic space, I call it, a green area. This is due to the property of homeodynamics. And the homeodynamic space, which is basically the three characteristics, stress tolerance, which is essential to our life. We are all the time under constant challenge from inside and outside. If our bodies can't take care of that, we are dead. Then damage management, damage control. The damage is occurring due to all the time the same processes. Oxygen, food, uh, basic biochemistry creates so many errors, so many damage. If our bodies cannot have uh, control over that, we cannot live. Then constant remodeling. This is a very important property for our immune system and many other systems and even in the functioning of the brain. How do we adapt and change? Now these are the characteristics which evolution has worked on according to the need of the essential lifespan, that they should not be affected, for example, in our species, in a significant manner before the age of 40, 45. Yeah? But then, when aging sets in, when the biological phenotype of aging sets in, what happens is, in the same way of uh, representation, one can talk about aging is the shrinkage of the homeodynamic space, our ability to tolerate stress, our ability to uh, da control the damage, our ability to adapt and remodel be is becoming lesser and lesser. And our red zone, the zone of vulnerability, that things can go wrong, increases. As a result, all those diseases, which in modern times in advanced societies are our main killers, or are the causes of all our suffering, are the diseases due to this process of aging. Whether it's neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer, Parkinson, or the uh, bones, uh, skeletal and bone-related diseases, osteoporosis, metabolic diseases, diabetes, arthritis, cataract, 
you name any major disease the common cause of all these diseases is aging we can definitely deal with one disease at a time that's we will come to that that's the biomedical approach to intervention but if we really want to do something about our long life and healthy aging we need to do something on the process of aging so aging is the shrinkage of the homeodynamic space that is the definition at least i use in my research work and why these things happen why this shrinkage happens why aging happens there are again lots of theories have been in the field and sometimes one can divide them into that there are central regulators or there are specific organ specific theories or there are system specific theories or epigenetic regulation or molecular uh, pathways the damage accumulation but from mechanistic point of view that why aging happens what's the main mechanism and cause of aging we generally agree that from aging point of view it's that uh, the fourth one the damage accumulation which becomes important i will come to that what is important also is to first of all uh, clear out that evolution has not made any genes to cause it these things happen but it is not because there are genes which are there in our bodies to cause it evolution does not select for geronto genes evolution works on survival pathways but it does not need survival pathways for infinity so evolution works on what we call longevity assurance processes which may become look like geronto genes because it's the same genes where things are going wrong so this is another very very important message from the biology of aging understanding that there are no programs to cause aging to kill the organism finally whatever those programs cell death apoptosis etc we know they are part and parcel of maintenance mechanisms apoptosis is very important during growth development maturation during immunity responses you know? but they are not the pathways they are not the genes to kill me they are the genes to keep me alive the fact is i will not be alive i will be having problems in old age so this is another very important achievement that there is no single enemy sitting in the body which we can send a missile and become healthy and live forever so this changes our viewpoint how to deal with the research on aging so the reason for shrinkage of the homeodynamic space and lack of any genes for aging is then explained by this fact that imperfect maintenance and impair mechanisms evolution does not work on perfection there is nothing perfect in evolution if you study scientific way of doing it we are not perfect creatures no other creature is perfect evolution does not need perfect systems it just needs the system to do the function for that much whatever uh, the purpose is whatever the essential life span is that's why there is correlations between species with shorter life span and species with longer life span if you compare any maintenance and repair system there will be a correlation that short lived species have poorer maintenance systems than long lived species but there are no killer pathways and that's very very important and this is what in the last 30 years most of us have been measuring different types of damages right in the dna level whether these are mutations epi mutations loss of telomeres base modifications whatever changes those are under the change in the dna so dna damage accumulates very well studied area and all the pathways same thing about rna damage protein damage and turnover other macromolecular damage that's a huge data that is where all that metabolic pathways are coming in and we understand which damage accumulates which doesn't do uh, much change the problem with the damage accumulation so far is we don't know how much damage is tolerated by the system and how much damage is actually allowed to stay and how much can cause problems because again from intervention point of view we need to know how much to protect from damage yeah if if uh, hydroxyguanosine is five fold increased with age 
in whatever example you study and I have a magic pill which can decrease the effort instead of increasing fivefold it is now only two and a half fold does it mean I am half aged have I become rejuvenated by half no that's what we will come to that so aging research has achieved so much in understanding why aging happens that's evolutionary reasons how aging happens these are the mechanistic aspects i have given you damage accumulation the third thing will be then what do we want to do and that's where the fact and fiction start giving us some problem are we still looking for the magical fountains of youth yeah, this is a 16th century german painting that in a, there is a place hypothetical imaginary place where there is a fountain and where old people can come in and at some stage they get fully rejuvenated and go about young very interesting social commentary here in this picture not even a single old man is entering into the fountain of youth as if rejuvenation and healthy aging or healthy life is only women's problem but that is what is society still doing it lot of things in the market are almost like these fountains of youth every day you will hear about miracle cures and this food or that drug or that chemical are we living in that fantasy or how do we want to proceed with this thing so the question here basically comes from the same painting as a background what do we really want to do when we use the word anti-aging or aging intervention and as a scientist i would like to know from people and public and society what do we really want to do with our age lifespan natural lifespan is about 45 with our great medical achievements we are able to now live almost double in most of the western countries and which are the situation is changing in all countries india is also uh, having increase in lifespan all the time but that's basically taking care of the early childhood diseases infectious diseases early deaths so that ha things happen in 150 years where we have doubled up our expected lifespan than essential lifespan. Now, but if we live during that time, if I live beyond 45, aging phenotype comes in. I know it's, it's sometimes strange to feel that aging old age starts from 45. Yes, biologically it starts from 45. Sociologically, there can be very many ways of saying it. The early old age, middle age. But between 45, now I'm 65. I have been living in old age for the last 20 years. Although between 45 and 60, that's from social point of view, that's perhaps the most powerful and most uh, uh, enjoyable phase of modern human beings, where we have power, where we are the bosses, where we are doing all intellectual activity. In old times, even to reach 45 was a rarity. Average lifespans about a thousand years ago were less than 20. Yeah? Very, very rarely anybody reached old ages. Now we all expect to reach old age. But what do we want to do? when we are old or when we are having limited lifespan because and I will die. So what will we want? Do we want to become young again? Is that our goal? That's where most of the anti-aging industry creates the fantasy of that rejuvenating and becoming young again. Is that what we want as society and as individual? We have to think about it. Or do we want to keep becoming old but slowly? that the rate of aging should be slow, which is already happening due to better nutrition, better medical facilities. Now we say that the, the modern 70 years age is oh, like the old 50. Yeah? So there is kind of a 20 years gain in health, but that's basic of social development, hygiene, medicines, technology. But the rate of aging, if we measure at any molecular level, has that been affected? We actually don't know. We don't know even how to do that. Then comes, we would like to become old, but stay healthy. Is that what we want? That all these diseases of old age, which are still a big problem, and socially that is from uh, those people who worship money too much, then it's a big money problem. Because it's the old age which uses most of uh, the healthcare money. It's even uh, discussed or um, analyzed that in our life, the amount of money which we spend on our health care 
90% of that money is spent in the last one year of life and you still die. Yeah? If you have spent, say, 10 lakh rupees in whole life on your health care in a normal, maybe 9 lakh rupees are spent on the last one year. Now, these are again very ethical issues, what to do with these situations. So, do we want to become old and stay healthy and what does that mean? We might touch on that either during uh, my lecture today or during your conference. I am giving you this framework so that rest of the conference, when you listen to fantastic lectures from people from all around the world, just think in those terms. Are there any programs we are telling? Are we trying to uh, kill some enemy? Are we trying to uh, stay healthy? Are we trying to prolong life? What are the approaches? Or the ultimate approach is basically get rid of death. Because aging is very frightening, not only due to the frailty and problems, it's most frightening because we know we die. The next step after that is death. I know I'm going to die one day. I don't know when. That's true. Nobody can tell about the death of an individual. I know all of you are going to die sooner or later. But I can't tell when, only statistically. I know all the people you love, they are also going to die. But we can't say when. It's a sad. The only compensation is all the people you hate, they will also die. So shouldn't we get rid of the death completely? Is that science should do? Eliminate death through whatever medication. But we have to then think about it. How do we go about doing it? And that is where our approaches come. How do we view the biological system? Aging interventions and the body as a machine. Still a lot of us believe in this old engineering metaphor, body as a machine that there are different parts of the body, they work together, but if something goes wrong, you can set it and you can affect the whole system. And that is what in this drawing again comes, the previous drawing where we have described so many things. And now we think that on each target, we can either have stimulators or inhibitors or stabilizers or removers. If mTOR is the association, let me stop mTOR. If telomere is lost, let me put back telomeres or if this pathway is lost, let me activate that pathway. This is called the one to one mechanistic approach, a reductionistic approach. The problem is those target things don't go upward to the system. By increasing my telomere length, you cannot make me young again. By resetting my some of the methylation patterns of some cell, you cannot rejuvenate me. But because the body has this complex interaction, adaptation, bypassing, all these properties of homeodynamics. So body as a machine metaphor should be abundant. But unfortunately, most of us, including sometimes in my lab also, we take one target at a time, one chemical, one plant extract, one magic compound, and show the activity of this enzyme, that RNA going up or down, and then we say anti-aging. No, no, no. Don't kid yourself. That is not anti-aging. That is, yes, you are able to manipulate that pathway to some extent. So how do we go? How do we characterize aging interventions? Aging interventions can be seen basically the dominant biomedical approach where is piecemeal remedies. What goes wrong, you try to set it. That is what science has done in the last 200 years and it's a great achievement at whatever level, whether it's organ replacement or even modern stem cell therapies or even senescent cell removal. These are the piecemeal remedies that which can help when there is an acute situation. Most of the time, even stem cells coming from a very young, very lively stem cell population does not perform in the old body. So these are piecemeal remedies, which is a biomedical approach for treatment of diseases and management. Then there are again the most common one which most of us are involved in either replenishment, whatever goes down with age, which hormone, which enzyme, which pathway, then I give something back to activate it or reactivate it and hope for the best. 
most of the times those things also don't seem to be working that much except in the extreme again disease states acute state but not as an aging process then the modern technology is after going to help a lot of people to have healthy aging by using better uh, daily life equipment mobility equipment so ideally what we need is this aging which is the shrinkage of the homeodynamic space can we slow down the shrinkage or can we regain some of the homeodynamic space again and that's where you need holistic approaches the total body approaches one thing at a time target is very good for experimental purposes for understanding the mechanisms but they are not practical more than 50 trials for getting rid of alzheimer's plaque a beta amyloid have failed because the target was removing beta amyloid and you remove it person is still not healthy and that's about even for a disease and what to talk about aging and old age which is much more complex so we need certain methods which can work on the homeodynamic space as such not in homeostasis homeodynamic things are changing but then we can do something about it and that's where i would like to introduce to the concept of this hormesis which some of you may be knowing some may not be knowing Hormesis is the relationship between stress and health. We all know that high level stress and continuous chronic stress is harmful and is the cause of many, many physical and mental diseases. But what we often forget is that the biology, our basic living processes depend upon stress. Stress is the principle of life every time I breathe, I create stress and that gives rise to a lot of complex biochemistry. And it is known that low level of stress, especially the stress of choice, if we are able to use is good for health. We all know that, we all do that. We deliberately give stress to our bodies to gain benefits. You know, what is that? Physical exercise. Nobody doubts the grand uh, advantages of physical exercise. I walk or I run and I get benefits at brain level. My cognition improves, my memory improves, my mood improves. How come? That's the holistic approach that something happening even at one level gets amplified and affects it. This is called in old terminology you might be familiar with these kind of uh, terms, uh, biphasic dose response, U-shaped curves, inverted U-shape, adaptive response. Uh, in the textbooks, we are taught like this, uh, no effect, but then linear curves or continuous toxicological. There are no curves which are of that shape in reality. Hormesis people, those people who work in the field of hormesis have analyzed thousands of papers to show that everything has a biphasic dose response. The things which are toxic at certain levels are generally stimulatory or health beneficial at lower level. But please remember, it is not homeopathy. That is what it sounds like. But homeopathy works at 10 orders of magnitude below Avogadro number. So that's a totally different story. So we don't go into that. But hormesis is challenging the system. You give the stress. The body has all these hundreds of pathways of stress response make details and then if the stress is manageable it becomes challenged you get benefits and this is the basic mechanisms behind um, hormesis at the cellular level there are basically seven major pathways of uh, stress response antioxidant response dna repair response uh, so when anything challenges a system and the system tries to respond by one or more pathways, it can potentially be hormetic and it can be beneficial. We call all those conditions as hormetins. Any condition which by causing stress or mild damage can be health beneficial is called hormetin. Physical hormetin. Exercise is the best example. Physical hormetin. You actually cause damage during exercise. You produce billions of more free radicals. You produce acids, you kill cells, and you get benefits which are whole body. So until 20 years ago, even people could not explain why exercise was good because whatever you measured was actually bad. Same. So in physical hormones, exercise 
heat, yeah, this sauna, even cold, uh, cold shock and radiation. These are the main categories. There is so much data showing that actually low level repeated uh, radiation exposure, just like low level moderate exercise repeatedly done has beneficial effects both on aging parameters and longevity parameters. That's what radiation also does. Same thing, heat does it. Then from the brain point of view, which you are uh, mostly involved uh, in this conference, mental hormones, lot of things in the brain also can be beneficial. The stress in the brain can be beneficial. Yeah, whether you do brain exercise by playing chess, Sudoku, reading, or even meditation. There are some papers published, including uh, the paper from one of the speakers in this conference, I think uh, uh, two lectures after me, Professor Gurchernikov, showing meditation having higher stress markers. The people who are in meditation, they actually have higher stress marker proteins like HSP. Same thing has been done in Hungary and other places that people put into meditation, go through the process of hormesis before you get benefits out of it. Very interesting topic and you in IAN conference, I think you should consider that. What are uh, the hormetic stresses? What are the hormones which we can use to challenge our brain, to stimulate it, to make it more active and stay active for longer period? Then there are lots of studies undergoing on nutritional hormones. Lot of things which we eat in our food, they are actually good because they are bad. All spices come under that category. What is the uh, nutritional value of even garlic, ginger, onion in terms of protein, carbohydrate and fats? Nothing. Or this uh, haldi. There is so much research on turmeric, curcumin. What is the nutritional value? Zero. And what does it do? It increases a little bit of turmeric or the curcumin causes oxidative stress. It activates NRF2 pathways, then hundreds of antioxidative genes take over and you get end result may be antioxidative, but the starting point is hormetic. All flavonoids, polyphenols, things like resveratrol, ginseng, ashwagandha, they induce low level of stress. This area is fantastically being developed both industrially and research wise. And that is where there is fact and fantasy can be separated. Yeah. And the other side of the nutritional hormesis is not eating food, either cook, uh, low calories or fasting once or twice a week or intermittent fasting. What does that do? That activates autophagy. Autophagy is a stress response. And that is what gives you the benefits of that. Yeah. So this is one area where uh, biological aging research is going in a big way checking combinations of hormones, one or two or three at a time, how to use it, what are the principles of hormesis. I don't have time for that. I'm already 37 minutes now. So I will be winding up telling the final message is that our aim in the field of aging is to have healthy aging, healthy old age, which will give us some advantage in the lifespan also in terms of number of years. But the most important part will be health span. That however, we do not have to go through one or more diseases for ourselves or for our loved one. So aim is maintain health, recover health, enhance health. To what extent, in what ways and for how long? That is also the very important thing. Do you really want to live forever? Why not? If I can make you immortal, if I can get rid of uh, death, wouldn't that be welcome, uh, welcome intervention? So I wish you all the best for the next three days of fantastic conference of Indian Academy of Neurosciences. And please consider all these aspects in a holistic manner. I have just advertised some of my recent books, a popular book on age, which is also available on Amazon, some books on hormesis, and a very recent book explaining health. Because we talk about health, but we don't know what is health. Health is not just absence of disease. Health is much more than that. And what is that? Maybe you can discuss during this conference. Okay, okay. shukriya. Thank you very much. Namaskar. I will be attending as many lectures on the net as possible.